It's Monday. If you're like this on Monday, how will you be on Friday? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. I like that a little bit more energy. We have to show ourselves in, um, properly in front of our guests. I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited to be here. Um, funny story, um, Panache and I, this is actually the first time we've met face-to-face. Uh, -face. It, it's a very Kenyan um, Silicon Savannah story that begins with the internet, but I read These Bows Will Rise Again, and I said, I need to know this mind. I need to have this person in my life. I need to have this person in my circle, because it's so rare to read a work of contemporary African nonfiction that is so searing and is so sort of it's so sharp, it's so insightful, it is the past, the present, and the future woven into a single text. Um, it is everything that you would want from a feminist piece of nonfiction and a little bit more. And um, it absolutely blew my mind. And I it immediately, I, I, it doesn't happen very often. Two hours, read the whole thing, and then went on, on Twitter. I was like, Panache, I think you're brilliant, I think you're wonderful, and the world needs more of you. So I'm very excited to be here today in case you haven't picked up on that. I'm going to be fangirling throughout. Um, and the point is, as Paula said, we're just going to have a very um, free-flowing conversation between us for about 30 minutes. Um, I want to get into some three important books uh, that Panache has put out, or three important texts is probably a better word. Um, many of you would have seen why I'm no longer talking to Nigerians about race and the controversy that ensued. <laughs> I love it. Um, the other one is um, These Bones Will Rise Again, um, which is, uh, to me, really one of the most important books that has come out of the continent over the last 10 years. Um, and then your, your novel, um, Sweet Medicine, which of course was the first book that you published. Um, I'm gonna try not to ask you too many banal questions. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it um, sort of abstract enough that you don't feel like there are any spoilers embedded in the text, but that is only because I want each of you to put your name on the waiting list and to buy a copy um, on the way out. So there will be as few spoilers um, as is humanly possible. Um, without further ado, let's get into it, Panache. Why are you no longer talking to Nigerians about race? What's up with that? So first of all, uh, just, well, first, before I, I start with that, is just to say thank you um, to the audience. This is the first time I'm in Kenya, um, although I think I once stopped over for a couple hours. So this is the longest time I've been in Kenya. This is about now maybe 10 hours. So thank you very much. I really, really appreciate um, just the response and the fact that I think we only put it out a few days ago and that this event is going to happen. So I really appreciate um, the spirit with which you've come to this. Um, and I know it's a Monday as well. So on top of that, you know, all the many different constraints, um, I just literally had said, listen, I am going to Kampala. I was just at the Writerism Festival and I'm going to Mogadishu and I might have some time in between. So can I just make a stop over in Nairobi and we can make something work? So this really speaks to uh, a kind of pan-African sisterhood that we have, um, that we met online. And uh, you know, I was just saying thank you to you just for the fact that I met you online and you know, I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in coming. You then connected me to your sister, and she said, hey, I'm going to do that. And I think that really speaks to um, a really great, again, spirit of pan-African sisterhood and that people are putting into place. So it's not just things that we write, it's things yes. that we, we put into place. So I really appreciate you for modeling that. And can we give her a round of applause for both of you? <laughs> okay. Um, and I hope to be able to host you wherever it is in the world that I am. At, yeah. at some point, yeah. 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 Um, so essentially, I think my interest has been in questions of black togetherness, um, what we historically know as pan-Africanism, uh, what we might sometimes think of as black internationalism, and thinking about the different kinds of experiences we have as Africans, um, and that rather than being something that divides us and um, makes it difficult for us to have a sense of understanding and come together and have a deeper understanding of how race, uh, colonialism, neocolonialism, white supremacy works. Instead, it has been used as a wedge um, against or between, amongst us. And this comes from a lot of my own experience. It's, I had the weird um, title of Zimbabwean South African. And you'll see the first um, poster that went out was just Zimbabwean. Um, and the reason that comes about is because of the fact that 
I grew up in South Africa to, uh, and considering myself Zimbabwean, growing up to Zimbabwean parents and having experienced um, what we know as Afrophobia because of xenophobia specifically targeted as at um, black people and people of African descent as well as Southeast Asian um, people as well in South Africa. Um, but within that, also then understanding and thinking about what it is to be in a space with other black people. How do I think of politics of solidarity um, as a black person who is also seen as a model black by virtue of being an educated Zimbabwean. So i.e. my parents or my father's a doctor, my mom's an accountant. So we then present the right kind of black people who are just supposed against black South Africans. At the same time, these many of Black South Africans are also then um, also speaking to kinds of anti-Black sentiments and enacting a particular kind of xenophobia. So we're almost stuck between two kinds of uh, forms of, of anti-Blackness. So it's always been a question for me: How do I um, speak to, for example, issues of xenophobia without then or Afrophobia without then fostering the kind of anti-Blackness that is used by white South African and former settler colony? And from there, in that kind of experience, in getting to understand my own history in Southern Africa, um, as someone moving from Zimbabwe to South Africa, I began to think about these questions of black solidarity, particularly as I became more and more influenced by um, ideologies such as black consciousness, pan-Africanism, black feminism, those are the things that became important for me. And so part of that quest for a pan-Africanism 2.0 has been to think about how do we enact a politics of solidarity with black people across the world. And one of the key issues for me is generally the issue around what we do when we're also in other people's houses. How do I then act on solidarity when at the same time, you know, it's very difficult for black people to get along because of anti-black forces. So we know the idea of being a model minority happens in the US, whether it's, you know, the more, more educated um, African students going there, and many of us who are in those institutions overseas know that very often we're the ones who get particular kinds of opportunities and the kinds of resentments that are fostered. So how do we operate in spaces amongst each other and have a deeper sense of empathy is what I was most interested in. Of course, you're also a writer, um, and um, part of being a creative writer is you're not just going to write a manifesto and just say, you know, these are the issues, blah, blah, blah. You're going to try and be creative about it. So part of the flair was to say, well, you know, the irony is that I'm referencing a Nigerian or a British Nigerian woman's article, which is um, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. And then, you know, then deciding that I'm going to say, well, I'm no longer talking to Nigerians about race. And that was, that came out of an, uh, a conversation, the upteenth conversation, frustrating conversation I had with a Nigerian friend of mine. And I said, well, it's an issue of lack of everything. He said, you know what, I've never heard anybody say it, or put it that way. Um, and then that's when the essay came out and I decided to write about something I've been thinking about as a result as well of my many travels through the African and Pan-African literary space. Um, I love that you brought up the whole settler colony distinction because there's only really about six or seven um, settler colonies in Africa, Zimbabwe, South Africa being the most well known, but also Kenya, Algeria, um, and you know Nigeria and Ghana, uh, British non-settler colonies. Um, do you think that settler colonies have a very unique experience of uh, racism that then impacts the way we are able to process these um, conversations? Definitely, and, and like I said, for me, the, having been born in Zimbabwe, moving to South Africa, and moving through those spaces, and I would think the third space as well, moving <coughs> through the US, you kind of get to see how racism can function if you just make different configurations. So you kind of go from a space where there are a couple, uh, you know, tens of thousands of white people, then you move to South Africa where there are millions of white people, so the percentage is different, so this is how it looks like. And then you go to the US and it's completely switched over. So you kind of see, this is how settler colonial administration works. So for example, the idea in South Africa that you have uh, people who are of mixed race heritage are called colored, for example, because we have we don't have the one drop rule. Whereas in the U.S. you do have one drop rule, so you kind of see how let's say Alicia Keys would be understood as black in America, whereas in South Africa she'd be colored, yeah. and you kind of get to see it's it's so arbitrary these racial kinds of distinctions when we told all them so true. So that's what was really interesting for me. But I think there's a lot of similarities within the settler colonies, particularly around the kinds of traumas that we have suffered. Um, and not just in the most obvious ways, but I think in deeper ways, where we, whether we look at things like family structures, 
for example, so the migrant labor system that was in play in Zimbabwe and South Africa, we see how many people do not grow up with their biological parents, um, families are split, we have a history of, you know, men having two families, for example, and that's different from polygamy, but particularly two families is one in the rural area, one in the city, that kind of thing, and if we look at something like, and it sounds like a trivial example, but even, you know, I was joking with a friend of mine, me, um, I pray parks, so we're talking about drinking, and there's a way in which I think people of the former settler colonies drink as if to drive our particular kinds of demons. Um, <laughs> observe next time there's a difference in how people drink. I, I just need to go downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, it, it, it really speaks to a kind of one the particular kinds of traumas, whether in South Africa, for example, used to have the dope system, um, and it still exists. So farm workers being paid in, al in alcohol, for example. So many communities that are alcoholic. Um, even the fact that when our settler colonial administrations were then you know, doing the apartheid, the, um, apartheid uh, spatial planning, there's going to be a beer hall and there's going to be a church. You know, there's a particular way in which they engineered our residential areas and spaces. So you can begin to see in those very destructive ways what settler colonialism did and destroyed our fiber of being beyond just, you know, the very surface level at which we discuss a lot of these things, which is why they become so much more emotional for some of us because we continue to see how these things have been um, or how we've been affected, but it's not to say the key issue here with the, with the essay was that all of us are affected by the forces of white supremacy. It's just that some of us have white bodies to make it easier and more apparent. Um, exactly. So that's what I think I wanted to highlight with that. So the aim there was, of course, I'm going to be um, provocative. Like I said, that's that's part of being a writer. You can be provocative and have a bit of flair when you do it. Um, but it's a very serious conversation about let's consolidate, let's wake up to the fact that we're all being affected by these issues and we need to come together to foster a new sense of pan-Africanism in this day and age. Um, there are two jumping off points that I want to touch on based on your answer. Um, one is you made the, you opened the essay at a Nigerian literary festival, so you're going to their house and standing in their living room and saying, hey guys, I have a couple of things that I want to say. <laughs> um, and it obviously triggered a very, very, um, uh, let's say intense reaction um, from Nigeria, uh, from Nigeria, Nigerian literary community, which is, um, in by many respects, the dominant Anglophone literature right now in Africa, um, especially because I find a lot of South African publishing is inward looking, yes. you know, and whereas Nigeria is kind of publishing in the name of Africa, um, very much uh, outward looking. Um, first of all, you know, the reaction to that, um, how did you um, feel about how people responded to the essay and, and subsequent conversations that it triggered? Um, but secondly, tied to that is, um, do you think in the, the current literary landscape, um, we are getting the right tools, literature is giving us, African literature is giving us the right tools to deal with white supremacy in the complexity that you've pointed out that we're not all having the same post-colonial experience because we did not have the same colonial experience. Are we getting the right frameworks to think about who we are basically in the modern world? Okay, that is a very, that's, that's an interesting question. We'll start with the the, big, with the responses. Um, I thought people were much nicer than, that, <laughs> than, than I was expecting them to be. Obviously you don't go and kick a hornet's nest and think that you know, people are going to smile at you and yeah. you're not going to get um, stung afterwards. So I was definitely very nervous beforehand. I mean, you know, you're going to go up to Nigerians and be like, hey, you know, so obviously I expected um, a lot harsher of your response. So I think I, I appreciated that. Um, I think, not to say that I didn't expect this, but I guess I would still say that I, uh, the, um, I knew that I was wading into a, into a debate that is historically understood as a men's debate. Um, so race, who are our race men? Um, and you know, black women, African women have always contributed to this conversation on um, African nationalism, um, identity, race, all kinds of things, but we are not really understood as the ones who can do that kind of um, thinking or the true um, representatives of, of the race or, or the nation. So I think that came through I haven't, I've been deliberate in not responding to any of the responses just yet. Um, in, in as much as we do live in the internet age, I was also interested in, in 
slowing down the process in as much as you know people had to wade through I think it was 8,000 words um, in this in this internet age um, I wanted it to also be a slow process because it took me a very long time to think about it and I've been about those things for a long time I also want a longer time to be able to respond to this but what I would say is that it's I do think it's telling that most of the responses have been by men um, and I would say that there's a tone that I recognize, um, and I often get it in a public space for a range of things, and there's often a kind of tone around, how did this little girl come into this kind of um, debate in this space? So I would hope, um, and it's not to have uh, views that necessarily agree with me, um, even the dissenting views are important, and hopefully more women come into this space. Um, and if you understand why I mean, you work with an um, understanding what the digital space and digital democracy mean, uh, how it actually functions. I think the digital space can be a very difficult one for women. Um, putting yourself out there is, is, is um, difficult. So sometimes, you know, you'll see that you put, you know, a particular opinion out there, and you, you justify particular kinds of things, and you've laid out all the facts. Someone then, you know, responds and says, but you didn't talk about this and this. I'm like, mm, if you read the piece, it said X, Y, Z. So the point being that there's a way in which women's views are Discounted because you're, you know, you're not really supposed to be wading into this kind of, of debate. So it's been quite interesting to see it from, from that perspective, and it kind of just reaffirm things that we've always known about this. And I hope that can um, change. And I think particularly, I would say that there's a way in which African literature, because we now understand it to be something that has become dominated by women, mm -hmm. um, the creative space in particular, mm -hmm. so i.e., the fiction space, um, I would almost conjecture that there's a way in which we understand that that's what women do now. We'll do the heavy intellectual work. Um, and I don't want to make a false binary. Fiction is also, of course, important intellectual work. But, you know, the essay, the polemic, that's not really the space for women to be doing that kind of thing. So that's the thing that's most, I think, interesting for me and the thing that I'd be most interested in developing, less so that do people respond favorably or not. Do we have who is responding is what I'm interested in. It's interesting. That's actually literally the, the same experience because I also write in a non-fiction space. It's, you get that similar uh, sense of um, where are the other female voices in this conversation? Where are the other female voices writing in, in depth? You know, yeah. Because it's, it, the digital is great for speedy responses and all of that, but sometimes the conversation needs to slow down. Sometimes we need to think about complexity and layers and, all of, and unpack all of that stuff. And, and you, you, you've pointed out a very um, keen thing that you know you feel as a female nonfiction writer in, in Africa at the moment is kind of, oh, well, there is Prashi over there. <laughs> um, and then there's someone else over there. Um, but um, I want to, again, tie that to the question of Pan-Africanism, because this is something that um, I think about a, a lot as well, and how Pan-Africanism has become this masculinized discourse. Um, and it's, you know, it's a process that begins with whose voices get amplified through history. Um, if I did a survey in this room and said, can you name me 10 Pan-African writers from the last um, 50 years? I know I would get some Biko, I would get some Cabral, I would get some whatever, but okay, now women only. Would we get to 10? Right? And it's not that they aren't there. It's not that they're not there. Not um, it, it's, it's the way in which we handle Pan-Africanism as a discourse. Um, which, of course, is something that you are writing directly against in these boroughs um, will rise again. Um, in this process, I, I, my tagline for this book is a feminist retelling of Zimbabwean history. Um, in this process of doing that, I hope you would accept that um, tagline, what did you excavate that you felt that people were missing in understanding at least the last 30, 35 years of Zimbabwean history. So, I'm going to speak to the, the, the first statement that you made around, or the previous statement around um, Pan-Africanism and women um, writers. Um, I've had a number of instances where I've had uh, the chance to interact with or speak, um, like say, in a public forum like this, um, to or question some of our forefathers of African literature, the giant patriarchs of, of African literature, and you ask them about their um, 
you ask them about women writers, and for example, and again, using the, the writers' um, festivals, you ask them, for example, Makerere in 1962, um, where the women you were there with in that photograph. Um, many of them, what they, what, what's interesting is this erasure, and, and um, this ties into what I'm doing with These Bones Rise Again, the archive, and the erasure and disappearing of women, even when they have been there, um, very often the response is to say, but women are dominating right now, and they will go and then sort of list, you know, there's the Chimamandas, there's the Nabayalit, there's, you know, and that's important, of course, but there's something very, it's not benevolent, it's not benign, that there's a way in which they are refusing to acknowledge the woman that they came up with. Mm -hmm. They're refusing to acknowledge, so it's like, but you've got these women now, so again, there's a seeding of the current literary space, mm -hmm. and almost there's a way in which it's like, yeah, it's not really African literature, there was the heyday of African literature, yeah. Now, you know, so there's this constant um, desire to erase the women that they were with, even though there's actual evidence that they were there. And so to get them to name, whether it's Guccieme Teta, whether it's to get them to name Amata, I do, it's very rare. And very often what they will do, if they do give you a woman, they'll say Nadine Gordimer. Mm, or uh, so I e, or Doris Lessing. So I e, the only woman that can possibly be peers to a lot of these um, anti-colonial men, these pan africanist men, are white women. So there's that kind of erasure, the disposability that we have, or that we that we embody in these kinds of movements. So that was something that was important for me. So it's important for me to always think about the way in which our foremothers are being disappeared, so that we, we're not the first ones to have these kinds of conversations. I mean, you read something like Sister Kildoy, for example, mm -hmm. when we think now about the African immigrant story, that is a brilliant pan-Africanist informed African immigrant um, um, narrative, but we don't often get that kind of story being referenced when we talk about African immigrant stories right now. So there's a way in which we're constantly doing a disservice to ourselves by forgetting the archive, or not searching and demanding for the archive and acting as if we're always the first ones to have done something. And so it was important for me then in thinking about These Bones Will Rise Again, which is essentially a commission. Um, Ella Wakatama Alfri um, had said to me um, that I'm interested, so this is a few weeks after the coup, not a coup had happened in Zimbabwe. Um, she said, you know, I'd be interested in hearing from you as a so-called born free, so i.e. someone was born after independence, um, what your view is on um, Mugabe's falling, particularly someone who has never known any other president. So I've always felt that in our analysis of Zimbabwe, and I think many other African nations, um, we're far too presentist, number one. Mm -hmm. So we speak of things as if they come out of vacuum. So particularly in the post-2000, so post-land reform era, as if land reform just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's not that it was a historic demand for justice, for example, mm -hmm. that precedes um, even the independence days, the reason we went to war, um, and starts right at the basis of colonialism right from the 1890s. So there is a way in which we never think about Zimbabwe with its long duration. So particularly with this coup, it's two weeks and you know, I don't think books that recount what happened in those two weeks are particularly insightful. That's a magazine, number one. But number two, um, it tells you what happened, but doesn't give you any insight into how and what is informing um, what, um, what happened. Um, and the second thing, beyond being too presentist, um, is that we focus too much on Mugabe. I've never felt that it's particularly insightful to focus on Mugabe in trying to understand Zimbabwe. And it's not just Mugabe who I find as problematic in as a lens through which to view the country. It's all the big men of history. So whether it's Cecil Don Rhodes to Ian Smith um, to Morgan Trangirai, I don't think that it's useful to focus on these figures alone. Of course, they're instrumental, but they are very much part and parcel or manifestations of the broader society that they come from. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was quite important to then say, what are the kinds of answers that I'm going to get if I look for different questions, if I look outside of the party political space, to also understand the kind of broader social, political, and cultural history that creates um, Zimbabwe over the last, you know, almost hundred, a couple hundred years. So I go back right, uh, um, uh, to the pre-colonial days right up until the, the moment of the coup. And that's important in order to pick out some of the trends. So for example, as it pertains to women, um, what you'll find is that um, in this book I'm going through, I decided to write through the story of my grandmother mm -hmm. and the anti-colonial heroine, Mbuyani Handa. Um, 
and again as a way of thinking about big and little women in Zimbabwe's history, how they're erased or how the images are distorted. And the image becoming important because we all look up at the presidential yeah. portrait was the first thing that people took down when um, Mugabe had fallen. So I'm searching for my grandmother's um, portrait, I'm looking and re-interrogating a famous portrait of Mubea Nihanda. Um, and as I'm looking for my grandmother's portrait, I am trying to figure out it's a portrait taken of her and her and her um, what I thought was my age, mm -hmm. but I come to realize she was 16 or so when mm -hmm. she took the picture. But the year in which I think the picture was taken is 1956, and that year is instrumental because one, um, <coughs> there's a song by uh, Dorothy Masuga called No Lishwa, mm -hmm. um, and in the song she sings about a woman who is so surprising, or society sees her surprising because she wears trousers and she's seen alone with a man who's not her boyfriend, mm -hmm. right? And she, she's scandalizing society yeah. because she wears trousers and she's seen alone with a, uh, without a man who is her boyfriend. Um, and this song, it might sound trivial, but in the same year, 1956, there were these, um, and it's, it's not spoken of, uh, spoken of a lot, the 1956 Carter House host, uh, hostel rapes. Mm -hmm of women who were living in a hostel in Bare Township in what is now Harare, um, and they were raped because they had not partaken in the bus boycott that had been called by the City Youth League, which is a precursor to ZAPU and ZANU PF, for example, the early nationalist movements. Um, and the excuse again was that these women must be prostitutes mm -hmm. because they are able to pay the fees um, for, the, for the bus, or the fares for the bus. And this word prostitute and way in which rape as a threat as something that we continue to see right up until this age where mm -hmm. Grace Mugabe is called a whore, mm -hmm. she's called a prostitute, so people are singing through the street saying we don't want to be uh, ruled by a whore. The former vice president was also called a prostitute in NDC, for example, when there was the succession battle um, between the various parties and the former deputy president was contesting against the current um, uh, president of the NDC, who's 40 years old. Um, she, at some point at Morgan Changirai's funeral, she was chased into a hut um, and she was again called a prostitute um, and they also um, threatened to burn down this hut. So this idea of the prostitute, a woman who is independent of male control, is consistently being called, being called a prostitute. But I raise this to say that there are particular kinds of trends that are beyond Mugabe. Yeah. There are particular kinds of trends that also have to do with our own border political and cultural history, even the term prostitute becomes a problem within the settler colonial history because women within the urban space were often understood, or African women in particular, in the urban space who did not have a marriage certificate and were not under male control of a guardian who were understood to be prostitutes who need to be removed from the city center. And in the post-independence phase, right after it was 1982, there was Operation Fina, where women who were walking um, in the streets of Harare and many other urban centers were simply removed and taken to jail because the idea is that you must be a prostitute. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with sex work. Yeah. That's not my issue. The yeah. issue here is what a woman who is independent of male control is seen to be, and that then being the kind of thing that must be addressed that is beyond a Mugabe, that's beyond a Zanu but then pervades throughout Zimbabwe's political culture. And that's the kind of thing that gets unearthed when you stop looking at him as the be-all and end-all to Zimbabwe's problems. It's not, it's not a value judgment on the profession. It really is a comment on how we weaponize yes. um, the idea of being a prostitute to beat women back into submission, to beat them back into, well, your value is only, the measure of a woman's value is in proximity to a suitable penis. Yes. That is how we decide whether she can occupy public space in a certain way, whether she can be in politics, whether she can be vocal, whether she can be um, present, really, in public life. And it is something, like you said, is something that unites probably Harare and Nairobi and Johannesburg and Algiers as settler colonies because women, are, black women, uh, native women, are not allowed to occupy um, the, the urban centers um, in a way that black men are allowed to unless they are able, they, they have to live under the burden of this particular label. Um, this is a great place to stop, I think, and, and hear from uh, the book directly. Um, you had a passage that you wanted to, to read for us, just to give you a flavor of what kind of book is the, this Bones Will Rise Again, these Bones Will Rise Again is, because it's not, it's so lyrical. And this is, for me, as someone who imagines along <laughs> as a book is being written, um, I found to be very, very useful. Um, and, and 
just enjoyable. It's a very lyrical book. It's a very, so even if you don't know anything about Zimbabwe, even if you don't know anything about the history of Zimbabwe, it's a book that is enjoyable to read. So um, I, I think you wanted to read a little bit of a section for us. Sure, yeah. So for those of you who do have a copy, uh, we're on page 29. Um, and I'll just give a brief, um, give you a brief context to it. So essentially, the thrust of the book, or my thesis, uh, comes from the idea that the military labeled the coup not to coup Operation Restore Legacy. Um, Operation Restore Legacy of the Liberation Struggle. So um, you've all heard the term Tumurenga, Tumurenga meaning revolutionary struggle. And so if they're saying that there's Tumurenga and a particularly a state-centered Tumurenga that I would, I would call a capital C Tumurenga that belongs to the state and the liberation um, or a particular liberation movement um, and those who fought with guns, I was interested in what liberation means to me, um, what a small C Tumrenga uh, would look like, um, one that belongs to my grandmother, my mother, myself, um, as well as my daughters, granddaughters, and that was what I was interested in. And central to this is the um, struggle for history and the various struggles we've had over time. Um, starting in the um, settler colonial days right up until the, the present um, in the ways in which history is deployed to uh, make particular claims about who does and doesn't belong. So this is what I'm, I'm really interested in in this book is writing history back to, to history. So this is page 29 and that speaks to the search for, for history. The struggles over history are complex because the present continuously slips into the past, marking history as always ambivalent, incomplete, a work in progress. When we pick apart linear histories of cause and effect, we are bound to discover that history doesn't march forward in a straight line of progress. Instead, history is like water. It lives between us and comes to us in waves. At times, it is still and unobtrusive, and at others, it is turbulent and threatening. Even at its most innocuous, water poses hidden dangers, enclosing contested histories, and so we're always living in the tension between water's tranquility and its tumult. When you walk along the water's edge, it's easy to take for granted the complex process of how that water reached our feet, to overlook what is washed away, what alters and what holds in the sands of time. It is an openness to history as a series of waves always moving, always in a state of flux, always a site of discovery in the past, present, and future, and not as something stable, foreclosed, frozen in the past, that is most troubling to nationalist agendas because it is too difficult to control. In the midst of these moving waves, quite far from the sturdy surface of Sekuru Zumira's granite boulders, the history that I am trying to craft begins with a moment etched on a surface that is man-made and far more flimsy. Perhaps less because of the surface's fragility and more because of the dislocations and disjunctures across gener generations and space, this is a history that begins with loss. The unsturdy surface is, or rather was, a studio photograph of Mbuya Lillian Chikumanzi as a young woman. I don't know whether it still exists, as a school child, this photograph was entrusted to my possession. I subsequently lost it, having, ironically, used it for a school project on family history. In it, she stands graceful, composed, sexy even. Her weight is on her left leg, and her right hip is slightly tilted. A white cotton dress, stark against her dark skin, stretches a little over her rounded tummy and slim hips. A conical head wrap, the kind worn by Miriam Makeba crowns her head. Lips parted, revealing a cheeky gap to swallow the world. She doesn't smile, there's nothing gratuitous here. Eyes wide, she meets my gaze, demanding that I be a witness. Her statement, if I hear her correctly, unbought and unbossed. Just arrived in Umtali, with no young man preparing to persuade any uncles for cattles he has not yet worked to own, no white family with dirty kitchens which need cleaning and kitchen and children who need raising, 
alone, unburdened, unattached, only belonging to herself. Or so it is in my imagining. I look again. Sometimes I see in this black and white photo something else. The photograph appeared to have been taken in the 1960s. She would have been around my age, her early 20s. A black and white photo with contrast softened by years of the sun. Her future receding into the monotony of her work, only for little sparks to be dulled by the weight of everyone else's future but her own. I sometimes see in her statement, the one to which she demands I bear witness, an epitaph that life has taught me. Sometimes dreams are colder than death. I've always felt profoundly sad about my childish negligence because, to my knowledge, this was the only individual portrait taken of my grandmother for at least a few decades. Perhaps this is what I love the most about that picture, that she was alone. That in that moment, she stood with no baby in her arms or on her back or husband by her side. I remember looking at the photo and always being struck by the ways in which she didn't look like the grandmother I knew. And perhaps this is the point. She is not my grandmother in that picture. She is not Buya Chikumazi, Maya Chikumazi, Mrs. Kenneth Chikumazi, Maya Rufina, Tete Lillian, Yaya Lili. She just is. She belongs to no one but herself. She is Lillian. That is who I find myself mourning, more than I mourn my grandmother. powerful declaration of intent um, for the book because you are bringing a person into the foreground. Um, the only women who get to belong to themselves in colonial Africa are women who have a proximity to power. They are someone's president so-and-so's daughter, um, chief so-and-so's wife, um, at least in the way we retell history. Well, of course, we have these outlines. We have here in Kenya, we talk about Mekat Lily, um, we talk about um, women who are in the resistance movement, we talk about these outliers who then get branded crazy. Mm -hmm. um, in centering your family and the women in your family in your retelling, were you afraid that some people might label them crazy? <laughs> um, I think it's difficult because a lot of my writing brings in memoir in some in some aspect, um, and there are a lot of decisions I have to make around the ethics around memoir, particularly when it's not just my story. Um, and in this particular case, you know, it's one thing to write about Nguyen Nihanda, who is perhaps the most famous liberation icon of figure in Zimbabwe's history, um, present. Um, it's another thing to bring my grandmother to the fore in this way, and particularly because she's no longer here. Um, and so there are, of course, things that I discover about her, about my family, about people in my family that I have to make particular kinds of decisions about whether I want to share that with the world. Um, because it's not neutral, just because I'm her granddaughter does not mean that um, you know, there's no questions I need to ask myself and what my intentions are and what I'm trying to do with her story and being responsible with that. Um, and particularly, we think about the ways in which, um, you know, even if you have a statement of feminist intent, we can do very colonizing things with people and, and invite a particular kind of gaze into people's lives that they didn't ask for. It's one thing for me to do that. So, for example, um, I... Um, had my, I, I deliberately, even as I found many family pictures, I, and people have asked me, you know, when we do a lot of publicity and I've written certain things, you know, four pictures of my family, um, I've become deliberate about not including pictures of my family, even when I do my own social media. I mean, I have lots of pictures of myself, uh, but that, that's my choice, and that's me. I live with that. I decide to do that, but to bring in people into that is not fair. And there's some point at which I have to also, um, stop. You know, people then ask me such more questions about some of my family members and I say, well, I can't tell you that because that's, this is as far as I can go with this, with this story. Um, so no, there haven't been any kinds of um, ideas of my, of my, um, any of my family members being crazy. <laughs> and people would say, oh, you know, your uncle's such a ride or die. Um, because, you know, very often throughout this, 
which also says something about the process of doing some of this research. I was chaperoned by an uncle or an aunt, um, and that's a whole other story about what it means to be a young black woman doing research, that very often I can't do that research by myself. I need someone else to be there. Otherwise, people are not going to be forthcoming. It's not safe. A whole range of other things that we can speak about, about a woman not being able to be alone um, as, as you do some of this research. But no, I haven't had any people think of, of um, any of the, the people I've written about as crazy. Fortunately, I think people have um, generally been quite inspired as I was by my grandmother's um, example and her story. Um, the story of Buena Mahanda um, and who she belongs to, obviously there's a little bit of um, contestation around that and you recently got into a little bit of a, <laughs> let's call it a kerfuffle. <laughs> um, about this in Bulawayo, I believe. Um, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about what the controversy was behind that and what it really says about who Zimbabwe, how Zimbabwean history, Zimbabwean sure. was, the yeah. Zimbabwean history. So to give a bit more background, these bones will rise again. The title comes from the famous dying words of Wea Nehanda, who is um, the person who spoke the words, or rather the spirit, the spirit medium, so it's difficult to distinguish, uh, rather, so they say, the spirit medium who was hung um, by the Br British um, in the 1890s, and specifically in 1898, in what we, what is called the first Chimrenga, I critique that in the book, um, by pulling it first Chimrenga, you're erasing maybe many other anti-colonial uprisings, particularly the Ndebele um, uprising that happened in 1893 and that kind of contribution in order to center Shona people as and have them as the key protagonists of the liberation history. And if you're the key protagonists of liberation, you also then own our democracy. So that's very political. Um, and so because I've been interested in um, decolonizing both, of course, the understanding of Shona liberation as just, um, of the liberation, liberation history as just Shona, it's also been important that in as much as I'm interested in an anti-colonial heroine like Nguya Nehanda, um, she's been made into a womb of the nation. So the idea being that um, a woman is almost hollowed out of anything that is you know, complex, so that either you're all good and you birth everything that is good in the nation, or you're all bad and you birth everything that is bad. So for example, in the post-independence phase, we have the example of um, uh, Amai Sally Mugabe, who is Mugabe's first wife, so she's all good, she's the Madonna to grace Mugabe's um, whore, right? That's literally what the people have, exactly, that's the kind of dichotomy that we have. We even see that with the Winnie Mandela, that kind of complexity, the ways in which women are disposable. And so I critique the ways in which figures like Mbuya Nehanda, while we appreciate that they are celebrated, it's not neutral. And there's a way in which she ranges above all other women to their exclusion. So particularly the former liberation, um, movements, fighters, the ex-competence, that's the kind, of, the kind of people who get erased in her being symbol, symbolically um, placed above everyone else. So in my doing research, particularly about portraiture and how that has been used, uh, because there's a famous photograph uh, of Vianne Hande that I, that I interrogated within this book, um, and Yvonne Vera called it the frozen image, uh, this portrait being one that was taken just before she was about to be executed. So this image has been used in so many different kinds of iterations, um, and there's a way in which it's been abused, and it's been frozen at a particular moment in time to suit particular nationalist agendas. So I was interested then in looking at who are the other female figures at that period of time. Brianna Handel was not as singular as it has made out, it been made out to be, um, in the liberation history, not just among Shona women, but other groups within the country, and particularly the Ndebele nation. Um, and so part of my interest was to say, well, I don't think it makes sense for me to be writing about women's history and only continue to write about Shona women. I think then that's participating in that kind of Shona centricity um, at the expense of all other narratives that is so very often critiqued in, in Zimbabwe. So um, I had proposed, I did a lecture at the National Gallery in um, Bulawayo, um, which it was a lecture series for the Lozi Queen, Lozi K. Lodo lecture series. Um, and that had been a lecture series that had been done by the late Dr. Ivan Vera, who is um, someone who I really looked up to for the understanding around this. 
um, and she being a Shona woman, or Shona, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than the essentialist identities that we have living in Bulawayo, and she was a former director there. Um, and so she had put in place the, the Laws of Cape Lord lecture series, and I had spoken to the director about, you know, reinstating this lecture series as not good enough for us to just talk about Nihanda, we need to talk about other mm -hmm. female figures. And so I did a lecture about uh, the portraiture of Queen Laws of Cape Lord, asking why it is that we only look at the portraiture of uh, Mbuyani Handa because, in fact, it's part of the editor's cut. That yeah. was actually part of this book. Yeah. Those are the things that, that didn't mm -hmm. make it in, into the book, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I found a space to then have a whole um, discussion about Queen Laws of Cape Lord and the pictures that were taken of her under very different circumstances um, in her own kraal, um, with the measure of control over her people in a way that Mbuyani Handa's picture did not have, and to then ask it questions about how we think of ourselves as a nation, and particularly at the moment of colonial encounter. So anyway, uh, there was some controversy about the fact that uh, myself as a Shona person, uh, speaking to the history of an Ndebele woman um, in Bulawayo on top of it, um, which is um, the seat, or the former seat of the, or of the Ndebele nation, and particularly as Shona people being the dominant group, both numerically, um, we are more than two thirds of, of the country, and given the particular history around Gukura Bundi, mm -hmm. which is a state-sponsored um, genocide mm -hmm. of Dewele pe people in the early 80s, so there's a lot of that kind of sensitivity, mm -hmm. justifiably so, <clears throat> about this particular history and the ways in which history has been written by a Zanu PF um, centered um, machinery that has erased Dewele history again to ensure that Shona people protagonist. Yeah. Um, and for me, I felt that it's not enough to just simply critique, critique Shona history and say, you know, so I'm going to continue doing that. But at what point, especially in particular when you're sitting on some information that not many people have access yeah. to, am I going to also dedicate time to also um, writing Dewele history as well? So there was uh, a protest. Yeah. <laughs> there was a protest um, at the lecture. Um, by the Mtuagazi Republic, which is um, a secessionist movement that's pushing for the uh, Matibele Land Republic, uh, Mtuagazi Republic, in fact. Um, I haven't commented on it, yeah. and I would say what I said then, which is to say that my own decolonial ethic that was, that's informed by, you know, having been part of the student movement, and we do protest, and I don't think there's a right way that you should or shouldn't protest, People have the rights to, and I welcome that in the sense that um, there is a reason why people would have felt that they have, this is the only way that they're going to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand some of the sensitivities around it, and I welcome the space for us as black people to have some of these, com these difficult conversations around what we understand by history. Um, within that, there are many questions that I also would have around, you know, the fact that we have white historians writing about Ndebele history all the time, but when a Shona person does it, it becomes problematic, and that speaks to the fact that we have to have a lot of different conversations with, amongst ourselves about some of these things. And some of the things, again, um, I, I must say there was a lot of the, um, there was a misogynistic bent mm -hmm. in some of how these things were, were, were put across. So I don't have a problem with, with people protesting and view, um, raising their concerns in whatever way they, they deem um, necessary. Um, I do have questions around whether you would have done that if I was a white man speaking about that very same history and a white woman, and they have done that very same history. So that, at the very least, it's, it at least was able to visualize a lot of the very clear tensions or tensions that haven't always been able to be seen because we're not interfacing on particular kinds of things. So I think that was really useful and important um, yeah. Mark in, in, in uh, public discourse is not. And it's not even necessarily about um, the fact that that platform exists and had to be um, revived is also another thing that we don't necessarily have the platforms to be able to have these kinds of complex conversations about our histories led by us in all of our complexities, not just um, the caricatures that exist, you know, um, Kenyans are this yes. um, and Kenyan historians and Zimbabwean historians are that. And that kind of ties into my last question. Um, you know, it's been a very tumultuous week in Zimbabwe. Um, we've had a lot of protests. We've seen um, 
uh, resurgence of state uh, violence against protesters, um, and um, there is a, a shifting sense of, well, take a step back, you know, as a Kenyan, um, this is one of the rare cases where the Kenyan education system actually did a relatively decent job. Um, because we did study the Chimaranga, mm -hmm. and we did study um, uh, because Zimbabwe and South Africa were part of the um, post-colonial consciousness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, this doesn't happen often, but this is one of the rare things that I do remember learning in school. It's about the Chimaranga and, and about Zimbabwe independence. And, and um, the, the sense you, you brought up at the beginning, it begins with land. It begins with contestation of who gets to own um, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, etc. Um, in your view, given everything that's happened over the last, um, let's say, five years, who does Zimbabwe belong to today? Well, I mean, at the official level, it belongs to who it's always belonged to. Um, it belongs to those with guns, um, those with money. Um, that's that's who the country belongs to. I mean, even even then, those with guns are protecting other interests. Really, they're. There are many kinds of uh, capitalist forces that we don't even begin to understand. And it's interesting, as I was reading your book, um, the figure of Tiny Rowland, for example, you know, people who own, um, you know, those set the colonial concerns like Lon Row and that kind of thing, who then actually give the money to and fund um, a lot of our military and many of our um, autocratic um, um, governments. So I don't think that ha that has changed. Um, and I think if we paid attention, we'd see, people would have seen. And again, if people had not been so focused on Mugabe, we would have understood that his removal was not going to change much uh, because ZANU-PF is a system. Um, and we're seeing that now. They're doing as they've always done in this moment. Of course, I believe Zimbabwe belongs to many more people. It belongs to all of its people. Um, and which is why, again, I was interested, <clears throat> even if this book was supposed to be about the fall of Mugabe, I chose to minimize his role very, very much, and to speak, well, not to minimize his role, but I chose to speak about many more things because I've never felt that it belongs to him and I don't think interested in him. Of course, you know, you spend time understanding who he is, but understanding that that is not the entire picture of who Zimbabwe is. So, of course, um, who really does own it at that level, who makes the decisions, who has the power, if that's the question, the same people who've had the power for a very long time, um, but who does it belong to? Um, it's not just, it belongs to our ancestors, it belongs to us, um, and it belongs to those who are going to come after us. Yeah. I have so many other questions, um, but I'd like to finish off with, I think it's an easy one, but we'll see how you feel. Um, which three records, music, should a person interested in Zimbabwe must listen, top three records that a person must listen to about Zimbabwe? Or Zimbabwean singers, or about Zimbabwe? Sure. Define it expansively. Okay. Well, something I neglected to mention, um, or make explicit here, was that, in fact, the book starts with a song. Mm -hmm. Actually, the book starts with a song, and throughout the book, uh, music is an important part of understanding both um, from the sense that um, I'm looking for history in the place we don't typically look for history, particularly with those of us who have histories that are not recorded in the ways in which we understand history proper to be uh, recorded. So that's why music is a very central part of it, but also because music, and particularly the Mbira, so if you, as you came in, um, you would have heard the Mbira playing, and I was playing um, We Are Still a uh, in the background, and Mbira music in particular was is important as a music of um, Chimurenga, mm -hmm. and particularly within the practice of Chimurenga, so i.e. communication mm -hmm. with the ancestors. So when you are at a Bira, which I think we need a better English term for this, a spirit possession ceremony, um, you would play music, whether it's the Bira or you play the Ngoma, which is the drums, and Hosha, which is um, rattle boards. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being a central part of our struggle, um, it's not just in the actual ceremonies, but also part of the conscientization mm -hmm. processes. So when I speak to my parents um, and my family about the liberation struggle, many of us will speak, they will speak about the first time the comrades would have, you know, uh, pulled them and told them to go and meet at the school, and it's time for conscientization. You start with a song, um, you'll be conscientized through music, all of those kinds of things. So it's an essential part, but also because 
it's important for us to understand, for us to understand our, ourselves as holistic people. So to speak about spirituality when we're talking about coups is not just about being you know, a religious fanatic or anything like that, it's to speak very holistically to how the liberation war was, was fought exactly and how we as people um, understand ourselves. Um, so, mm, songs, three songs, oh, I hate lists because I, I, I always feel like I want to add afterwards. But um, right now, let me just say what I've, I've, I've been listening to Stella Chueche's um, album. It's on iTunes, Apple Music, if you have it. Um, it's called Kasawa, and it, it was, it's many of her early um, releases. Um, also listen to, if you want to understand Zimbabwe a little bit, listen to Joe Fraser as well. Um, also, I, I, I analyzed some of his music and how also problematically he played into um, a sonic revolution, a sonic coup. It's a, it's a term that um, by a um, academic by the name of Moze Chiboedo he uses, so he was very much part of that. Um, who else is another person? Hmm. Um, obviously, Oliver Mtukudzi is, is someone we can all uh, listen to. Um, there is an entire playlist that I have online, actually, for these bones to rise again, but his songs are referenced there. Thomas Mafumo's uh, music as well is really, really important. Um, there, there's Shoni, so a whole range of people, but I have, throughout the book, you'll see that music is always referenced, but someone I think is really important um, beyond Zimbabwe, of course, all of these artists transcend Zimbabwe, but um, Dorothy Masuka, um, I recently wrote about her, um, very, another very long essay about her music and her Pan-Africanist consciousness, um, but particularly because of the way in which through her music she epitomized the Pan-Africanist legacy, writing about and against the set of colonial state in South Africa, um, writing about Mumba, for example, writing against the Zimbabwean set of colonial state, and in her moving around the continent, she really does embody a kind of feminist or pan-Africanist feminist uh, format that, that um, many of us can look up to um, and I think is not celebrated enough. So I would really hope that more people look to her and I think particularly look to her as an intellectual. Yeah. Um, intellectual Intellectualism is not just writing a book. There are many other forms in which that is embodied and carried out and I think she's one of our important, most important um, intellectuals and we should be looking more towards that and I hope more people um, can begin to celebrate her for that. Great. Um, I have so many other questions that I want to ask you, um, but I recognize that I don't want to monopolize um, the time. So we're going to open up to questions from the audience. We're going to take three questions at a time, and then we're going to give Panasha time to respond to those. Um, please keep your questions brief. She says she's okay with mine is more of a comment than a question. I might jump in there and do some interventionism. Um, <laughs> but um, try and keep it brief so we can get as many questions um, as possible. So um, let's just begin at the front of the program. I always, can I, can I do, I haven't yes. done this in a while, but my fullest in the, sorry. Yes. Um, I, I do like to ask that the woman speak first. Um, if that's okay. Yeah, she had her hand up first. There yes. <laughs> okay, everyone, please speak into the mic. Again, it's a recording. This is important. Um, producing from the back. Um, so, we three at a time? Three at a time. Yeah, I think she had her. Yeah. Uh, Panashi, thank you so much for writing this um, beautiful work of art. So, for me, my question is really about you and the emotional process that you had to go through when you're uncovering these histories. I think to be a young African woman working in um, histo historical spaces particularly is to be, to be met with a lot of mistrust because you're not the kind of person who should be speaking to people about what they feel. And so you, auto you automatically have frustration and doubt as, as you speak to people. But then when you step away from the archives and the colonial representations, you unearth a lot of pain mm -hmm. and silence. So when, um, for instance, Boya Chiganze, when she says some things are just not asked about, how do you deal at a personal level with emotional vulnerability and just the sacrifice and just the entire process of, of writing a book like this? Mm -hmm. Great question. We'll take Uh, thanks for joining us. I've been following your work since around um, 2016. And um, my question is about um, an essay 
you wrote called uh, Small Deaths, um, which was quite um, personal in a way that I haven't seen um, in your previous works. So I just wanted to know um, if all of, if part of it was nonfiction or um, or all of it is nonfiction, and also what inspired you writing that and publishing it where you did. And the last one on the right. There we go. No, we had there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for a really, really beautiful Monday evening. Uh, my question um, is in the excavation um, that you uh, that you went through, is there a way in which your understanding of yourself and your identity changed? And if it did, what are the ways in which you have uh, put yourself together again, that perhaps is different. Man, y'all are just the audience. Gotta come prepared. Yeah. <laughs> You're asking for a lot of vulnerability here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the emotional process. Um, there's a lot, I think, in trying to unearth some of these things, and I think just generally in, in um, being a black woman, right, and putting your, your work out there, um, there, if you want to doubt yourself, you know, and in particular, um, so there's many layers to this, I'm going to answer some of the, the layers, particularly things I've been thinking about a lot lately over the last, um, maybe, two months, um, or even the last year, really doing a lot of sort of historical work, um, but particularly, um, I think about two weeks ago, last month I was in Zimbabwe when I was doing some research, uh, particularly a lot of archival research, but in one particular section I was trying to speak to former female war veterans. Um, it's frustrating a lot of times, um, because even, like I mentioned, in trying to do research sometimes, I have to go with people. I can never go by myself. Um, somebody has to get the approval. And there's many layers to this. First of all, uh, people have been brutalized, and um, I don't think anybody has the right to, I mean, uh, no one is entitled to an answer from anyone, right? So sometimes, very honestly, people send me interview questions, and I don't answer sometimes. That's just what it is, right? So why can't I also grant somebody who lives in a rural area that kind of right to tell me or not if they whether they feel like it or not. Um, but I think, you know, it's been interesting when then even in traveling with other people, the things that they have to say in order to justify why this, you should speak to this girl. So, oh, she's a PhD student. Oh, she's doing this. Oh, she's doing that. Oh, and I think, but why do I need all of those things? Surely it's enough that I want to do this work. Um, and even then, it's still not enough. So the number of times you're questioned and you realize that there's nothing you can do to escape that, because the problem is not that you don't have the qualifications, the problem is that you're a black woman. And mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do to, to, to get that. And I think also, to, you know, even in our pursuit of, you know, that's why I don't believe in things like black excellence, because the issue we're trying to uh, qualify ourselves out of is not something you're going to get through qualifications. The issue is, is the black woman. That's, that's what the actual issue is. Um, and so, I mean, even my uncle, who, again, luckily with some of these patriarchs, that's their tax, they chaperone me around and do these things, and I, I appreciate them, but again, ideally they shouldn't have to do that work um, for me. Um, he then, you know, he sent me somewhere, he'd asked someone to do some research with me, and he said, he said, oh, what was your experience with him? And I struggled to say, mm, he was dismissive, I couldn't really, put it out there that like, yeah, he just thought this is a person, because it sounds like you're being, you're being paranoid. He says, yes, and he confirmed it, that, you know, people don't know what to do with the fact that you're a young girl asking these questions that you shouldn't be asking. Um, and so, at least it, it made me feel better because I'm like, okay, I'm not crazy. I know that this is actually happening. Um, so it's dealing with a lot of the mistrust, but when it came to my family in particular, um, the things about some things are just not asked about. It is recognizing that there's a lot of pain and people had to withhold a lot of things for their, for their, for their protection. 
as well. So for example, my grandmother, when she's speaking about her son, my uncle, going to the war, you could not say that my child has been taken because the soldiers are going to come and brutalize your family, or you know, so you're caught in the crossfire, so you had to keep those things a secret. So you continue to, people continue that, that, that cycle. And even as I spoke to some um, former female war veterans, the first thing, even if I'd had approval from someone else, you'd get there and they'd say, okay, you need to speak to the chief, the counselor, the so-and-so, this and this, then I'll speak to you. And they're very consistent with that. But what I found is that once they started speaking, people wouldn't stop. They just went on and on. And you know, sometimes I would not even be prompting. I'm just writing and I'm going and I'm going. And you realize that people also haven't had a space, particularly a lot of women haven't had a space to really talk about some of these things. Um, and again, you have to then ask yourself a lot of those ethical questions about what does this mean for me to be then entrusted with this information? Um, you know, and, and it is always strange, you know, say, oh, can you please clarify? You know, clarify as in, can you please recount that? I didn't hear you just tell me that you jumped over your sister when she was killed and then you had to run. You know, that's those kinds of things where you feel that, how do I continue asking that and how do I not reenact the kind of colonial research relationships? That's always the question that I'm asking myself. So there's a lot that goes through. I mean, we could write a whole book about that kind of thing, what it is to be, you know, going back to your own communities and doing some of these works and, and thinking about what is the relationship to Let's say I'm writing this story, and rightfully so, people are going to ask you, What am I going to get? Because historically, they've never gotten anything, right? I'm going to be the researcher who's done all this great work excavating stories. What do they have after then having spoken to me and reopened those wounds? So, you have to really think about the ethics. Um, even then, when that former female war veteran says, I don't want to tell you that story, she knows that there's consequences for speaking that, that, about that. I'm going to then go fly around saying, Oh, you know, I did this great book about female, former, uh, former female war veterans, she has to deal with her comrades now, after that. Um, she has to deal with her family looking at her differently. So there's a lot of those questions that I have for myself, and it's not always easy. And the times that I get really frustrated, where I'm just like, why do I have to? And that's different with some of the people who are more disempowered, but those who have more access to information, who will do this weird thing where they're like, all the information's in my head. Literally, like, I've got it all here. Or oh, they'll show you a piece of paper and say, oh, I can't, literally, I've had people do that to me. Um, and you're like, why are you withholding this information and getting so much joy out of withholding? So you really do question yourself a lot, and I have questioned myself, and, and really felt reduced a lot. And that's exactly the point, because you're not supposed to be doing this kind of thing. But yeah, so you're hearing the incoherence around that, because it, there's a lot that you can emotion that I also have to sort of process around that kind of thing. But you also just think, imagine this is what, how I feel about researching how do the people who have to actually sit with these stories actually feel. So it's a process and I think the more many of us doing that research work come together to actually think about what's, what's the methodology that we, that we employ. Um, one of um, my really good friends, Wangani Madondo, gave me a really good advice many years ago. Um, I wanted to do research with, with Dorothy Masuka, in fact, actually. I wanted, to, I wanted to write about her song, Mondishwa, um, but I was just going to do dear stop research. And he said, go and speak to her. And I was like, oh, like, you know, I just want to get my story done and finish. And he said, and it was taking forever to try and get access to her. And he said, go to her house, sit with her, eat with her, observe her. Then you can ask her questions, but go and spend time with her and don't just come with you know, your interview questions. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned as well, is that you don't come with, oh, I've got two hours and I have 10 questions to ask you, you know, that kind of thing. You have to really be with people and work with their time yeah. and not come with that sense of entitlement. So even when I'm doing my research with them now, I'm like, mm, you know, this thing of coming to do research over a week well, is not working. I need to come back and spend a year where I can really sit with and earn people's trust because I'm not entitled to their trust. So that's the biggest thing that I'm also learning. So yeah, I know that was a long answer <laughs> to that, but there's a lot to that. <laughs> like I said, we, I think we need to we need to to to, to form some groups around because I think there's many of us who need to do this work and are doing this work and we can think about what are the ways in which we can best do this work. So that's also re re replicable. 
and it shouldn't always take so many resources in order to do this work, and it shouldn't take uncles and whoever to always take us to get this work done so that this is, this is um, done elsewhere. Um, so the second question was around small debts. The small debts is a short story that I published in Transition magazine, uh, I think in 2016, 2017, I think. Um, and it's, I think it's the only, no, it's the second, first short story I've published. I've published two short stories. It's the first time, well, it's interesting, first of all, because all my work generally, even when I'm writing nonfiction, has generally has the mark of autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, generally, most of my work, there is some me in it. I probably have some anecdote about how I relate to the story in some way. Um, that, so it's interesting that you'd call that my most personal. Um, and perhaps it might be because it's the first time I wrote about South Africa in my, non, in my fiction. Um, because I used to have a binary where it was to say that I do South Africa in my non-fiction and then I do Zimbabwe in my fiction. Um, and I suppose that's also to do with you know, even, it's only very recently that I now insist on being Zimbabwean South African and speaks to my own relationships to how much ownership I feel over South Africa um, and how much I feel that I can get into its interiority even if I have lived there all of my life, all of my conscious life, really. Um, and so that story was an exploration of a particular young black girl um, within the Fallist movement, and it was questions I was asking myself at that time, particularly around Afro-pessimism um, and what it really means to struggle. Um, yeah, so there were those questions I was working out through that 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 story, and I think it was a moment in Fallism, so that within being part of the student movement, um, you know, we'd have these moments where, you know, people are asking questions and having particular kinds of debates. So probably many of the arguments that were there were in that. Um, but it was set in Cape Town, where I was in, in Johannesburg. But, um, yeah, so I think in that way it was autobiographical um, in a way that, I, I guess, I, I still think all work is autobiographical. Even if you're writing with somebody else, you're still writing about yourself in some way or not uh, other. But I guess part of the sense that you would get that it's so autobiographical is because it was some someone who was probably my age yeah. um, also had a similar kind of trajectory that I would have had. Um, but yeah, I think it was also my trying to reckon with some of the questions that I had for myself um, around Afro-pessimism. So for those of you who don't know, part of what I was in, Afro-pessimism being a black radical intellectual tradition school of thought that was quite central to some aspects or some strains of the student movement um, in South Africa and questions around um, the only way for this to end is for the world to end. So I'm asking, you know, that what does it mean for the world to end? Does the world really need to end? And is all black life social death? And what are the many things that we enact um, as, as black people in order to live every day. How do we subsume ourselves every day? Um, and the book that actually set it off beyond, before the student movement was actually reading Margot Jefferson's Negro Land. Um, and that was interesting because that's about 50s America, desegregating America, black elite, and how they're fitting into that America and the contemplation of suicide. Um, the cultivation of depression as an act of resistance because, you know, as a black woman, you're not supposed to falter, you're always supposed to be, you know. Um, and I, anyway, since then, I, I still am quite influenced by Afro-pessimism. I think it's an interesting and important tool of analysis. And it, I guess it was also quite liberating for me because there's a way in which um, we're always told that we shall prevail, we shall yeah. overcome. Um, and that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, which I do not believe it does. Um, and, 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 and it's interesting, people never know what to do with the fact that I would say I'm a half-hearted Afro-pessimist, that I don't necessarily really believe that we will get our freedom. Um, and people are like, so... Oh no, I mean, we'll have that intellectual fight, but people think, people never know what to do with that, because then it's like, then why do you do what you do? And for me, you know, one of the things that was most interesting about being in the student movement and 
you know, you're facing sort of the real sort of life or death questions and sort of, uh, you're going to get arrested or not. <laughs> in that moment of really interfacing with that, your blackness in that way, there's a way in which you can never feel more alive than that. Mm. Um, struggle in and of itself, to me, is also an end. Um, there's something about fighting for your life and fighting for your existence is also an end. Um, and there's ways in which I derive meaning out of that, so it will never, even if I never get to that decolonial future, it's still worth fighting for whether we get there or not. And that's, I think, difficult for many people to reconcile, so why, why spend all that time doing, um, even if you don't think you necessarily will get there, but I still think it's worth doing and I derive meaning from that, yeah, exactly. So it's weird, yeah, I know that you... <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's the kind of question that you'd have from, like, beloved, speaking about Tony Morrison, so i.e. the idea that in that moment, so i.e. if you believe that black life is not, is, is really death, then you'd rather kill your child, right? Um, so what does it mean for you to choose to continue having children? Does that not mean an optimism about the future for those people who do have the choice mm -hmm. to have children or not. So the, those are the kind of questions that I was grappling with with that story. Um, the excavation of yourself, identity, where do I get to at the end of it? Um, yeah, there's a lot um, with it. Um, so many layers to it. I mean, the one thing that's on top of my, um, at the top of my head right now is how I, the first thing I think is just at the center, yes, there's the, how the world views women and particularly black women, but it was more just how do I view the women in my life. So i.e., how do I view my grandmother? Um, why did I not ask particular kinds of questions, and how do I view the woman in my life right now? And that's a, um, <clears throat> a negotiation that I'm constantly going through. Um, the book has definitely brought me closer to my family, and, and, and as I speak about family, family is not an unproblematic um, site. It's not just a family can be problematic, family can also be incredibly violent as well. Um, and, you know, there are often people who are the sacrificial lambs, whatever things that are there, you discover all kinds of things as well. So it's family within the complexity of it. <clears throat> and the pain and the beauty and everything that comes with what family is. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the biggest thing was just having to really work in with how I thought of the women in my life. Um, and how then I and that then translates into how I view myself as well. So, yeah, that's the very surface level within that. But it, it did bring me a lot of, I hate to use the word catharsis, um, because it's never just an ending. And there's still moments when I will cry, you know, and think about that. And, you know, if I think about, would I have this book or have, you know, I don't believe in fate, another one of my controversial views, um, I don't believe in fate. Um, but, um, it's important that through this process, there's so many other people that I've got to understand um, by now thinking more than just, now I was not only interested in my grandmother, so I don't know if had my grandmother been there, I would have then also spoken to the other people in my life as well. So again, like the fake part, I don't want to say that, oh, she needed to die so that I could do this, so I don't, that's, I don't, I, I wouldn't go there. Yeah. But with what has happened, is that it has opened so much more in that way. And I think that now that, as so, I mean, as we're talking, I'm going through it as well. I think the biggest thing that it has brought me to is not just an intellectual understanding of our spirituality, um, but a much more lived understanding of our uh, spirituality. Um, and what that means for me even intellectually and in the work that I do, and this is a long process, it's not seeing this as outside of the tradition of mediumship. Um, but what I mean by that is that all work that we're doing, in as far as we're guided by decolonial ethics, is spiritual work. 
and is guided by a historic mission. Um, so in the work that you're doing, you are carrying out a mission and it's beyond simply you. Um, and accepting that as not just, it's both a burden and a privilege and not in a sort of messiah complex or that kind of thing. But, so I think we all have our parts to play within this historic mission. There are those who can do healing work, there are those who can do um, the music, for example. Um, and so Stella Church, there won't be a medium of that. There are those of us who are going to do the academic work. That's all part and parcel of a particular historic mission. And I find that there are many, particularly in Zimbabwe, I'm finding a lot of us, not only just in Zimbabwe, but I think across the world, a lot of us are coming back to the spirit um, and accepting that and seeing that there's historic work that we need to do, um, whether it's people talking about um, the um, different gods and goddesses that we have in different cultures, speaking about different people speaking about um, spirits that may guide them. And I think that's maybe, I think the reason why you're only getting me to say this now, I'm only coming to say this now is because it's taken a while for me to not just be like, oh, this is thing I happen to study, you know, to like, oh, okay, this is actually something that's also working through you. Um, and it's not always easy to, honestly, it's not easy to admit because um, I think there's still a lot of stigma around what is or who does mediumship and what is our spirituality. So I eat someone can talk about being led by the spirit of God, but to speak about being led by the spirit of ancestors is not something that, and I don't even think I could still say it in front of my parents, for example. I've only just recently stopped going to church with them. And I'm even, I can't believe I'm even saying this out loud, right? Because it's such, and I'm recording, because, because there are a lot, there's a lot of stigma around it and, and very, it's seen as demonic, um, even like my grandmother, when we come, I came back the night before we'd gone to Avira, which is spirit position ceremony, um, and she was just like, oh, like, yeah. you know, and there's that kind of sense of, you know, so you wouldn't even say that publicly um, because it's usually, but that's also part of the, the, the mission is understanding that me, who speaks my weird Shona and has lived in and out of Zimbabwe, for me to also take ownership of that also frees a whole range of people because we understand it's only people in the backward rural areas who do this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's only people who don't have education who take this stuff seriously. And then it's the white academics who study this shamanship that, you know, it's not, so it's our time to then take this and be part of, and not saying that we are the messiahs, but the point being that this is also part of our job to bring this back to the fore of our, our that. So I think that's the thing that's probably been the biggest shift of late is understanding that this is also something that I need to stop running away from it yeah. and just keeping it as a cool intellectual thing that yeah. I can decide yeah. kind of thing. Great. Um, we're going to take another round of questions. Um, three questions. Make them count, folks. One, two. Yep. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll ask the last question. Okay. <laughs> it's actually not my question. It's the question she asked earlier, which you, I don't think you answered. Uh, she was asking you whether you have, um, you, you've noticed that whether we have the tools in African writing today. Um, I think you asked that question. Yeah. Huh? yeah, I didn't hear the answer to that. I'm interested in that. Avoid things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Panashi. I'm Ken, Ken Miao, and uh, I love the fact that you've, uh, you say that Zimbabwe belongs to the Zimbabweans who are there, who are there, and we are there, and that uh, that's what makes Zimbabwe, and that um, the, uh, the struggle in itself is an end, is an end to itself. So, what do you think? If, uh, do you think uh, it is the struggle of the Zimbabweans that will make, or that is the sweet medicine that these bones will uh, rise again? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <it's terrifying. laughs> so, I've never been good at poetic analysis. Can you just be clear with you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
make sure I I get your your. Thank you. Uh, I must say I'm a poet, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I just hope to know the inside of because uh, I do like. Okay, I do love Africa, and uh, I normally think that uh, Africa ought to be at par with the other part of the globe. Because uh, we are all living in the 21st century, the first part of the 21st century. And uh, as every part of the world lives, we live. We reach 100 years, we are all at the same 100 years. So how do we make it so? Yeah. So to the host. To the host. To the host. Can I quickly ask how many Zimbabweans or Southern Africans we have? Here, just to raise your hand so we, we see you here. Okay, thank you. Okay, this gentleman with the hat had his hand up in the picture. Okay, thank you very much, actually. Uh, just to start with a small comment from one of African philosopher, Dr. Julius Nyerere, who first said that for Africa to catch up with the West, Africa has to run while the West is working. And I can remember a comment by a Newsweek editor who said this. For Africa to catch up with the West, they first have to crawl, to walk, and then to run. But Africa has not even known how to crawl. How then will they really catch up with the West? This one brings me to the challenges you talked about. As you are writing, Ashona, and history of independence. It shows the conflict and contradictions that Africa is still experiencing. Here in Kenya, the same task as quo happens in writing about the Mau Mau liberation struggle and the pettiness of the tribal ideologies that prevail, and I hope so, in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Africa has not even known how to crawl, and a generation is going and has gone. I really feel that it's really going to be a uphill task for our children and our grandchildren to come, as you are saying, to inherit this history. Because once the history is gone and the people who are there are not winning because they are part of the status quo that is, is benefiting from this story being hidden, they are not going to allow it to be unhinged. So how do you see on how we can reclaim this continent in terms of writing, depending on all these conflicts and contradictions that are prevailing throughout the continent. Thank you. That is a long question. Um, because it's going to be the last round of questions, does anybody have a very quick question? And I'm going to time you. If you go over one and a half minutes, I'm going to clear my throat obnoxiously and just be like, it's a wrap. Go. Now. I won't start you there. Okay, fine. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Um, so my question was about what, my question is about um, solidarity politics and what you've written in um, the essay we've written. Um, yeah, the essay. So um, you spoke a little bit about how you take issue with the way that a lot of people who go to the West think of their first encounter with blackness being when they actually reach that said Western country. Um, and so that's embroiled with a lot of class politics, um, as you alluded to within your essay. But my question is about how um, how you think about how we how we are going about forming solidarity links at the moment. Because a lot of the ways that we do it is online and even that on the continent is enrolled with class politics. Um, so thinking about how we can form solidarity that's not simply um, based on your class position um, and, and how that's not, class doesn't just come up um, when you travel, but it, it, it is something that we're dealing with now when we're engaging with that online and how we can do that um, in ways that are um, far-reaching and not just simply, um, you know, 
limited to class women, um, women that have access to theory and things like that. <laughs> and I know this is a fifth question, but last question. You've been in Nairobi for, what, 12 hours? What about Nairobi feels familiar to you and why? Last question. <laughs> Literally, I will like obnoxiously say what okay. I'm going to be very quick, but thank you very much, uh, Panache and Nanjela. I really feel excited when I see young women uh, writing and uh, able to express. Just very quick, um, if you could just tell us shortly, how did you feel? How did you do your first book? What are some of the challenges you, did for, uh, you faced when uh, you wanted to do your publication? Because uh, I have a young cousin, and you know, she's this feminist and so conscious. And she told me, living in an African family, sometimes it's just too much for you. Their relatives, their parents, and sometimes you're married and the expectations. So sometimes it doesn't give you that space to be yourself and to be creative. And also considering the expectations uh, of what you are. And when you look at the writers, these writers, are they with the few African writers who are existing? Are they women in the, the marriage and in the system? Are there more women who are more intellectual and living their own way, the way they own set? <laughs> so I'm Kenyan, but I feel so South African because my son is Kenyan South African and I spent eight years in South Africa. My picture was South African. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to start with the how familiar. Well, I just came from Kampala. I would say Uganda actually feels more more similar to Zimbabwe, um, just language-wise, um, a lot of the words are similar. But today I was getting chapati, and I was asking for like the food, and they said, oh, uh, machungu? Machungo. Machungo. Well, we call it machungu, so it's like the same word, it's the very same word. Yes, exactly. So even with the language, so, so a lot of those kinds of things were there. Um, yeah, so language feels very much um, the same. Um, I mean, I've literally been in like my <laughs> very very short period, but um, those are the, the things I think around even just food. I, one thing I often do because I had to get my hair cut, so I, I make a, a, a thing about going to different salons and different places. Um, also because it's a men's space. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, it's a glimpse into men's culture in different spaces that I, that I yeah. have, but it, it was quite similar in, in the, yeah, so you can ask me impressions. I, I think what you're, t what you're getting from me is that I'm not good at answering fast. That's why I'm, I'm terrible on Twitter and I write long, I'm, I'm too old to write short things anymore. Um, <laughs> so I'll think a bit more about what the things that I find are similar. Are similar. Um, yeah, let me not say the thing I just thought about. Um, I actually saw women's bodies, and that's not that's not that's a weird comment to make. Um, but it was just nice to see like curves. curves. You know, I noticed that. And I was like, oh, you know, what's in that in that kind of? No, because there are places in which sometimes you feel a bit out of place because you know. So it was nice to see that kind of um, thing as well. But um, I'll I'll think a bit more about what are the, the similarities. But it was definitely language is something that I find very interesting. That there are a lot of words that are quite similar all all the time. With that. Um, okay, let's go to the last one about challenges. So. That's separate from the actual publishing industry stuff. That's a whole nother layer. I'm just going to speak to those challenges about being a, a, a room of one's own um, and being a black woman writer, an African woman writer. Um, one reason why I love Sula by Toni Morrison is because of how and the word is not, I'm using this word ironically because I don't think that's the word that we should be using, but how radically selfish she is um, and choosing herself and how sometimes in order to do the things that we want to do, and particularly writing um, as African women, as black women, we have to be radically selfish um, and something that I've been called many times by partners, by family, um, friends, most of them male, call me selfish, 
And selfishness means when you need writing in general, I think there are people who can write when there's a lot of things happening. I need my time, my space to write. And particularly, I'm a morning person. For example, I'm not an evening person. So to give you a practical example of what this means about being selfish as a writer and what's going to be difficult for um, you said it was your niece, um, is, for example, what time do people get up? Let's say I went to the rural areas and like people wake up by 4 a.m., all the women are up in the house cooking, cleaning, doing X, Y, Z. That's my writing time. That's the time that I'm most productive. I can't write later on. Um, I decide I'm not going to help because I feel like doing my writing. Um, not well, but because I need to do my writing at that time. That's how I'm going to get my manuscript done. That's how I'm going to get my reading done. Um, my brother, no one else wakes him up. He gets up when he wakes up. Panache is selfish. My brother's not selfish. Mm -hmm. I had to choose myself. But he's never been put into the position where he has to choose himself because the world chooses him for him anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? So those are the ways in which even just getting the time, and I've, you know, I've been doing a lot of writing workshops and I've met a lot of young women who have this yearning to write and oh, it's painful. You can hear, you know, how much they want to and they're struggling against their family saying, I want to write, but they think I'm crazy, but I want to do this thing. And it is hard to be writing when your family doesn't yet see. So it's easier now, progressively, now that, oh, now you've got a book, now you've got one to do, so you can see where this thing goes. But to be able to be given the time, and even now I still feel guilty, like I go visit my grandmother, and for me to be like, oh, well, I'm just gonna go off and just write when people are doing work, doing you know household work, doing whatever, it still feels incredibly selfish, and I sometimes have to stop myself, like, it's fine, right? Nobody else questions when boys go off and do X, Y, Z, so, and, but at the same time, it's then how do you, how do you do that without just replicating how men behave? Because that's also not useful, right? So it's, it's a complicated thing. And even when I've gone and writing res residencies, you've asked about marriage, and I think that also leads to children. Very often, the people in writing residencies are either young women like myself who are childless, or older women who either their kids are grown up and they've left. So I knew one woman in the last residency I went to, um, she was now coming back to her writing career mm -hmm. now that her children I had left the house. the house. So that's when she was. And in the same writing residency, one of the, she was middle aged and she was actually from Israel. She had to leave the writing residency because she had left her daughter, who's about 10, <coughs> with her husband. Um, and I mean, she, I remember at the beginning she said, oh, they get along so well, blah, 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 blah. But something was not working and then she had to go back home. Mm -hmm. You've never heard of a man who mm -hmm. happened in my residency as well. Exactly the same thing. The only person who had a child um, who was living at home, she had to leave yeah. to go off halfway through her residency. Everybody else, older women, kids have left the house, my peer group, and men who have partners yeah, men. who are taking care of everything. Exactly. The men are not thinking about those questions like who is looking after the child, who's doing one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not because the trouble with it is that you don't. In the, so yes, I can be selfish for myself, but then what about the time I'm taking from other women who then could maybe also have their mind share freed up to do other kinds of work. So this is, the selfishness is not, and Sue is a good example because it also is a destructive kind of selfishness. So it's not the end in and of itself. It's just to speak to a transitional phase. We need to think about how uh, sort of reproduction of household life affect how we all get to do work and don't get to do work. And those are the kinds of barriers that I think your niece is going to face. First and foremost, about getting the time and space to say, I'm just reading my book. I'm just getting to do one, one to three. And it's not just the young women. It's also, what, what if my mom wants to sit and read, for example, and get to also free her mind and also get to do other kinds of things. So it's a very complicated kind of thing. There's no simple answer I'm going to be able to give you here. But at least if you're also aware as an aunt you know, but how do you create the space for her to be able to have, you know, a room of her own to just get to work and do and free her mind and also be deliberate about even dynamics about who gets to speak when. So I did mention, for example, that it was men who responded first. It was interesting because the woman who told me in my DMs that they thought this and this and this about the piece, and I said, oh, why don't you write that out? 
And they'd say, mm, no, I still need to think about it more. And I was like, well, I don't think it's modeling what the main do, because I think some of them needed to think more about what they wrote. Because, <laughs> um, again, simply aping what men do, I don't think that's, that's liberation, right? Yeah. I don't think men live, I don't envy their existence. Um, you know, so the point being that you then, as niece, I mean, as aunt, if you can help to foster as much as possible, and I think there are some still great writing initiatives around, and if you can, you know, get her to go to some of the festivals, get her to go and meet and see the examples of women, and next time there is a Kali Media event, for example, you bring her so she can also see the example of women, I think that will also be helpful for her um, there. But the conversation then about the other barriers is not, but let's just focus on the yeah. barrier at home to even get it right. Yeah. That's, I think, some of the things you can begin to do, but also just bring black, back home books by black women. That yeah. would also be a huge, huge difference because you'll then see that, you know, there have been women who've been before me and who can write, and I think that will also be helpful for her. Um, okay, so... Zimbabwe struggle, sweet medicine, um, yes. So, I'm going to hijack your question to kind of answer the question that was there. Um, something I wanted to highlight was part of what spirit possession, taking it very seriously as a political and philosophical standpoint, it's not just this thing that we do, there's a lot of there's an intellectual position behind what it is that we're doing. It's both a practice or a philopraxis, so a lived philosophy that we have, the idea that those in the present speak or communicate with those in the past about the future to come, and that being kind of decolonization of time. That's really important because I think very often when we think about Africa's future, um, it is about a particular generation doing that work. Um, and I think that's also a very recent thing. I don't think in the past people necessarily did that. Um, there was an understanding, and again, why I talk about Chimurenga as an ethic is that with part of the spirit position is understanding that we must get the guidance from our ancestors and we must work hand in hand with them in order to lead a particular kind of revolution or struggle that is concerned with the future of those who are going to come after us. So you're constantly working with all generations at a particular point in time. Um, and part of the folly of colonialism is it's not just once in the colonial encounter the colonization of land, it's particularly the colonization of time and the separation of us between generations. So the idea being that, you know, there's a colonial encounter and you're told by Hegel that Africa has no history, the history of Africans, or Africa is the history of Europeans in Africa. Everything that you've done before is not even history. Um, it's natural history, you know, in fact, uh, because you belong in, uh, in um, fauna and flora, really. That's what, that's what you are, right? Um, in many places, we were considered part of fauna and flora. You know, Aboriginals only just recently not considered fauna and flora of, of that. That's part of the colonial um, logic. So, that colonization of time, understanding us, you know, which is why I don't say our traditional beliefs anymore, um, because it's way in which what we have done is always fossilized. Um, whereas um, anything that comes before the colonial encounter is fossilized into a primordial, you know, past that sits st somewhere else. But we can continue to cite um, Plato, for example. Mm -hmm. We can continue to cite Hegel, and that's timeless. Mm -hmm. You go and cite Nyerere, and oh my God, this stuck in the past, uh, pan-Africanist, you know, old school somebody. That's that's outdated, you know. So that coloniality of time operates at so many different levels in terms of how we think about ourselves and the legacies that we should be employing to create the kind of presence or past, present, and future that we that we envision. Um, and so my sense really is that part of the struggle for us is that it's not about, and again in, in a very practical example, we think that Zimbabwe's future is about old dying and then you being born. So Mugabe goes, Zimbabwe's future begins. 
Um, and I mentioned, and I would get into trouble for mentioning something like this, but I was very specific in saying that the NDC, for example, in that succession battle, in some of the undemocratic processes that took place uh, within the NDC, and bear in mind that Morgan Changirai only left the presidency of, a, of, that, of his party through death, um, the fact that a 40-year-old is also employing some of these undemocratic practices shows you the fact that this is not about a generation going and everything will be fine. There's work that we actively have to do all the time and constantly having to safeguard uh, and safeguard and work for our, um, and I don't want to say decolonial futures, but our decolonial, uh, our decolonial lives. Let's use that as a, as a, as a, as a provisional term. And that's why I, I, I think that the idea of the moral arc of, of, of the universe bending towards justice is a problematic term. And again, it's, it's, it's a way, of, that's a very much a Western idea of how history functions, that it's just a forward march into, into progress, because that means that we just assume that, you know, one generation of these is necessarily going to get better, but we see that history keeps on repeating itself. So the point, that's when we then have to go back into our archives that's when we have to keep on tapping into these different traditions. Uh, traditions. We have to keep on tapping into the knowledge of our ancestors and those who are going to come in front of us because history is always moving and moving in those kinds of cycles. So it's a different way of approaching our understanding um, of what struggle means, which is not just one generation against the other generation, which is typically how people talk and think about um, African politics. So usually it's, it's opposition uh, parties that are forward-looking and all about bullet trains and about Western models of democracy and then it's the old liberation movement you know, who are only interested in the past and the, the, the real struggle to me is in between that we have all of these traditions coming together that's what we should be doing um, and for me I would critique my ancestor Nyerere with his statement about Africa needing to catch up to the West um, I don't think that if we if we take people like Cesare who've written about the West, um, his, his uh, text, A Discourse on Colonialism, they're not a model that I would ever want to um, copy. Um, there is no humanity in dehumanizing other people, and we can see Europe eating itself now. It really is che chickens coming home to roost. Um, and it's not the first time that this has happened. Mm -hmm. The world wars, a lot of what they had been doing in the colonies finally came to mm -hmm. their shores. Germany's own genocide of, um, Jewish well, Jewish people, but it's specifically in, within, in uh, Namibia. And uh, that was the first genocide of the 20th century. So are we surprised that then we're going to see something like World War One, World War II, because they've been doing it to us for a very long time. Um, and that development, um, so-called development that they have has always been at the expense of other people. It is our ancestors' bones that have built European civilizations. Their bones, it's their blood, their sweat and their tears that have built Europe and the West, uh, North America to be what it is. Um, the kinds of the leaps that they, they took within the Industrial Revolution, how America got to be America was through the blood, sweat, and tears of black people. So, that through the, you know, so everything that they've done has been at the dehumanization of other people, and it continues even within their own countries. So, for me, I think our those of our ancestors who look to the West as a model um, might have been mistaken. Uh, not might have; they were mistaken in in that model. Um, and I think that's part of then actually really interrogating. What do we mean when we talk about decolonization? Is decolonization simply getting a seat at the master's table, master's house? I don't want a seat at that table. Um, it is a fundamental reimagination, and that's the work of our writers to be doing the work of radical reimagination. That's what writers are there to do. But all of us, in as far as we're concerned about our politics and our society, have to be engaged in the act of reimagining. Reimagine how do we want. Uh, our relations to be amongst each other. And I think at the core of that, I would go to Ubuntu and not the gentrified um, <laughs> kind of meaningless way which has been used in South Africa, the post-apartheid term, which is just, you know, 
really Ubuntu without Abantu, right? As in without black people, um, without accountability. So I really understand that a person is a person through others. To be human is to the extent that you're upholding the humanity of other people. And that goes towards even us. It's not saying that, oh, with using that lens, we have to then think about how all African people are taken forward by the decolonial uh, vision that we present. So are we going to have one that is not marked by the class divisions? So I, we don't want a situation where we simply have new black masters ruling over other black people. Because some of us are only fighting or are offended by colonialism in as far as we're not able to subjugate other people. That's really our issue. It's not really that we want all of us to be free. The issue is that you are not also allowed to share in the spoils. I think it really interrogates many of these, of these things. And it's not just in that economic sense, it's also in terms of gender issues, for example. Um, some of us are just fighting to have positions of men, for example. That's not a decolonial feminist feature. Some of us are maybe fighting to just have the same position as heterosexual people, for example, or maybe cisgender people. There's a whole range of ways in which we fundamentally need to reimagine what it is to relate to each other. Um, as people, and I think that what needs to be at the core. Having the West as a model is not useful at all. It's yeah. why then we can prop up certain autocrats because, oh, they are giving us economic development mm. and the West loves them and X, Y, Z, because that is our understanding. That You're is shaking our many tables. <laughs> <laughs> that is our yardstick for what is supposed to be progress. So we need to have that bravery to have a fundamental reimagination of who we are, and it's difficult, it's not going to be easy, um, we're going to be shaken by that, but I think we need to allow ourselves the vulnerability to try again, and we're going to get it wrong, but we're going to keep on trying and trying and trying, and even in and of itself, which is why I don't really care for, well, it's not to undermine the fact that people are there are real consequences to living under colonialism and oppressive structures, but the idea that we're always being forced to rush to when are we going to get there or what exactly must it look like? No, let us do the hard work and sit and grapple with ourselves and sit with the discomfort around these kinds of things. So which is what I mean by sitting with the discomfort of someone is going to protest me, for example. You're not always going to be right. That's true. You know, just because you're historically colonized doesn't mean that you're always going to be right. So we have to be able to allow ourselves that space of vulnerability to try and try and try again. Um, and I think that's the way in which we're going to catch up to ourselves, rediscover yep. ourselves, um, and not continue to look to people who I don't think have any business telling us how to um, yes. live or go about um, our lives. I'm going to ask you to pick one, one last one. Yes. And okay. To that, and then if it's not yours, maybe we can just catch up. Yeah. I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, I'm, I'm done. But um, so your question, um, James, about do we have the tools? Um, so as I was reading your book, um, Nanjala, what I really enjoyed, again, is about the section where you speak about archive. And what an archive allows us to do to understand how it is that we've gotten to where we've gotten to, how we imagine ourselves, and, and that being a political act of memorialization and what we do and don't put into the archive. Um, and so it's not to say that I believe everything has been done has been done before, it hasn't. Um, or everything that can be done has been done before, but I think I find a lot of the answers I'm looking for by also returning to the archive a lot and looking for the kinds of forgotten texts that are out there or some of the things that are out of print. And of course, that's a very particular kind of privilege to be able to find those texts. They're often very expensive. It often requires university access to many kinds of things. So I speak as someone who's doing African edition, of course I can do that kind of thing. Um, I do think that we need more um, more in the sense of there's certain stories that are amplified and I don't think being a writer is necessarily an inherently radical position 
just it's just another job. And it, it's it is that writes his decision to take on a decolonial ethic, um, and they it's also their right not to take on that decolonial ethic. Um, and it's not for me to say who does and doesn't take on that that decolonial ethic, um, but I would say for myself, I find that a lot of the tools that I need to think about that pan-Africanist future, I, I find that in going back into the archive. Um, and that then allows me to do a lot more of that work of reimagination. So I think people are doing it, but it's also just, again, um, thinking more about going to looking to different sources, so not just on, I don't know, Barack Obama's five, top 10, five Afri top 10 African books, for example. Um, it's looking at the books that are not published by the publishers, mm -hmm. for example, the books that aren't going to get the big advance, for example. Um, why, for example, I really love going to Writivism and the Writivism Short Story Prize. That's not a thing that's held in London or anything like that, but mm -hmm. there are many very interesting stories that are coming out there. Mm -hmm. um, and in those kind of platforms that are often overlooked um, because they're not big and shiny and because they're not international, and international really meaning waste, yeah. um, that's where I find that a lot of the tools really are there. So it's also just questioning what is amplified. So again, as I raise the, the issue that our archive, and particularly the women's archive and the archive of those who are marginalized, whether because of their sexuality or their gender and their class position, for example, is part of them going back, and that's where I find a lot of the freedoms, for example, for me. And I think things are there if we just look in the right places and not just to wait for, you know, particular kinds of lists of you know, CNN African Voices, and this is what we're going to have as, as our barometer of what's a good writer well, or not. Good. Thank you so much. Can we please have a round of applause?